three narratives, three possible ways, questions obviously about the role of New Zealand tertiary institutions and the New Zealand government and other Western institutions in providing education in the Gulf. It raises questions about the propriety of doing this, it raises questions about culture, it raises an enormous number of questions about English as a language of education. And it raises a lot of questions about the success or otherwise of teaching Western style journalism and Western style education courses in countries which are not Western and never will be. And this is this third narrative has recently been taken up by a researcher from Western Australia, Dr. Jo Beata Josephi, who's produced a book on teaching journalism in countries which have slightly lower standards of freedom of expression than our own. So, three narratives, three possible ways of doing this. For those of you who don't know me or haven't seen me around, briefly I arrived here two months ago after spending a year in Oman teaching the AUT curriculum in the College of Higher Education, in the College of Applied Science in Nizwa, which is a town in a desert valley about 5,000 feet up in the mountains and about two hours drive from Muscat. Wonderful people, great country, but oh my God, the course. So I had a lot of exciting times and frustrating times. And, and, and then, alhamdulillah, I wound up here. I found myself bumping into Susan O'Rourke, found my, suddenly found that all of my experiences had become the subject of learned articles and research. So, I'll talk about it, I think, from, at least in the beginning, the second narrative part. Basically what happened was that AUT was asked to provide a journalism program now. Susan O'Rourke says that they were under the impression that what the Omani Ministry of Higher Education wanted was a Western-style course. Now, note, under the impression, and I would have to say that from my experience, the Omanis are past masters at giving you the impression or letting you believe. That's about as far as I'll put it. So I can quite believe that Susan O'Rourke and her team genuinely believed that a Western style program was required. And that's what they designed. And that's what they presented. And from talking to Susan O'Rourke, I understand that there was a meeting at which her Excellency, the Minister for, for Higher Education, said, this will succeed. <laughs> now, when Her Excellency says this will succeed, it doesn't matter if it's a total and utter failure. <laughs> it will succeed. Because nothing will go wrong on paper, ever. No matter how bad it is, the minister will not be told. The minister will not be informed. I know from talking to Susan O'Rourke that she read all of the feedback sheets from the faculty involved. She said she could always pick mine because steam came off them. <laughs> she gave feedback to the director of the program. There were recommendations that the program be changed, that we be given this support and time off, and we should be rewriting the program, etc., etc., etc. None of these recommendations ever made it from the director down to us. Certainly, the director would not have given them 
to anybody higher than the Deputy Director of Higher Education, who might have given them to his boss, but who probably would never have given them to the Minister. Now, the Ministry told Susan O'Rourke that, no, no, we wanted an O'Malley degree, but taught in English. So, voila, you go away and rewrite it, but there was never any rewriting done. The other thing that's interesting in terms of how this was arranged was that this was not to be an AUT degree. AUT sold the intellectual rights to the content, which was handed over. Okay? This was to be changed and then eventually become an Omani degree. And when I left, they were quietly slipping in classes in Arabic. They were quietly making all kinds of changes. And the net result is going to be, I fear, that within a year or two, they will have a degree which is validated by the Ministry of Higher Education in Oman, but which they will be quietly referring to as, oh, our New Zealand degree. Yeah. I have no proof of this, but I suspect this is the case. Now, this opens up a lot more questions. It opens up questions about how Western institutions become involved in the market in the Gulf and how they deal with it. Now, New Zealand has almost no presence in the GCC in higher education. It actually has an enormous presence commercially. Okay, anchor butter is everywhere. It has an awful lot of technical training contracts. Did you know that Omani air controllers are trained in the desert wastes of the Canterbury Plains? Okay. New Zealand actually has been very clever in going out and getting niche markets, but involvement in tertiary education in the GCC, very minor. Apart from Oman, there's virtually nothing. Even Australia has learned its lesson. UCQ tried Dubai but failed. University of Southern Queensland set up a campus. And then when the Vice-Chancellor came back from holiday, the two people who'd set up the campus were marched under escort <laughs> off the Toowoomba campus and sacked and it was closed down. I won't tell you how that came about, except perhaps by some visual examples. <laughs> Cameron didn't get that, I hope. Um, there's the University of Wollongong and there's Curtin, and that's it. Australia and New Zealand have pretty much stayed out of the Gulf. Now, here's a figure for you I want you to keep in mind. According to an estimate, by 2020, the population of the GCC states, now that's Oman, the Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, will be 53 million people. Of whom, more than half are going to be under 25. Okay. According to a report prepared for the Dubai government, by 2020, there will be 11.3 million people of educational age, that is between kindergarten and doing a BA. Think about that. That's an enormous number of people. Okay? This happens when you have families where, you know, 12 children is normal. Mm. And then they all marry their cousins and have another 12 each. Now, here's the thing. Somewhere along the future, somebody is going to be thinking, do we go and get involved with this? Australia and New Zealand have been restrained and, I think, sensible and haven't leapt in. Austrade describes the Dubai market as being saturated, and it probably is. Oman isn't. Okay, Oman is not. Let me show you some figures. This is the number of foreign universities operating in GCC states. 
And these figures will be an absolute understatement. Okay? These are the ones which are demonstrably foreign. Kuwait, two from the US. Uh, universities and colleges, two from Australia, one from the Netherlands. The USA, eight American, two Australian, one from the UK, the Sorbonne. Do you know there's a branch of the Sorbonne in Abu Dhabi? One Canadian, one Indian. Oman has one from Germany, one from the UK. Bahrain has one. KSA Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, of course, has none. Okay? Now, Qatar did an interesting thing. They just said, we'll have a national university. But you know, we're just going to invite, we're just going to put out for tender, basically, the rest of the tertiary education system. We're going to put it out for tender. Net result, all these American universities applied and the, and the Qatari government said, great, we'll build your buildings, your infrastructure, your roads, if you come. So you want to do interior design? You go to a branch campus of Virginia Commonwealth. Okay? That's how it works. Foreign universities have looked at the Gulf and gone, yippee, it's a market. As I said, the Antipodians have been more restrained. But Oman has two private universities. One of them actually has a tie-up with Queensland Uni, but they're independent. But what's happened is that the foreign universities have come in and they kind of spread and they're distorting the market. Now where they're established and where there are rules and where there's firm leadership, it doesn't work too badly. You know, Mar, yes, it's they're a while behind the rest of the Gulf. So things went pretty badly there. But why foreign universities and colleges? What does that do to the local market? Why would they be there? Obviously they can make money, but let's have a think. Who's in the Gulf? It's four million people in the Emirates. Now, depending on whose figures you believe, somewhere between 400,000 and 800,000 of them are Emiratis. The rest were foreigners, people like me. Okay, I was, I was in Abu Dhabi for nine years. And the rest of those people, well, we had children, didn't we? And we wanted to send them to good private schools, mainly because we weren't allowed into the government schools, of course, and they're all in Arabic, and they're all terrible. So what happens? First, there's a huge market Okay, the American International, the American Community School, Al Kubirat, where you can do A levels and play cricket like a gentleman. It's the British, sorry, Madrasa Britannia, okay, the British school. And there are private schools, oh dear, our own English high school, places like that where some poor teacher from India might get a thousand dirhams a month if she's lucky teaching in a crammer, teaching English. The result of this is that you've got the government schools producing kids who speak Arabic and a few words of English. You've got the private sector producing all of these children from around the world who've now been educated in English using American, British, Canadian, heaven knows what other kind of English language education systems and they come out and their parents expect them to go to a good university. 